All right, we'll get started. Thanks so much to everybody who's joined us. And um, I'm Jordan Gansmors, the uh, faculty director of the Russian, Eurasian, East European Studies Program at Northwestern University. Uh, I'd like to thank Annalise Riles, the executive director of the Buffett Institute for International Affairs, um, and Ian Hurd, the uh, director of the Weinberg College Center for International and Area Studies, who are helping sponsor this event. Um, we have a number of fantastic panelists that I'd like to introduce first, um, and then we're going to uh, use the format for those who are familiar with these events that we've been running since uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, we will start by uh, spending um, a, a couple minutes giving our each, each of our speakers time to talk about the work that they've been doing, the organizations have been doing. I'll post some questions as the moderator, and then we'll open this up uh, to um, the audience to share their questions, and hopefully we can get them answered for you. Uh, our first panelist that is joining us today, uh, those of you who've been at these events have, have met him before, <clears throat> is Timofey Milovanov. He's the president of the Kiev School of Economics. Uh, as many of you may know, the Kiev School of Economics has raised millions of dollars and facilitated logistics for delivering humanitarian aid to Ukrainians in need and uh, non-lethal military assistance to those on the front lines. Um, Professor Milovanov is also the advisor to Ukraine's presidential administration and the former Minister of Economic Development, Trade, and Agriculture. Uh, we also have joining us Donald Bowser. He's an international anti-corruption and security expert with over 25 years of experience advising organizations, including the UNDP, the World Bank, Transparency International, and anti-corruption agencies in multiple countries. He's worked extensively in Ukraine. Since the invasion, he's been engaged in founding and fundraising, implementing a project called the uh, Protect People in Ukraine Project that delivers non-lethal military assistance to uh, the military military forces in Ukraine. And then we have also joining us uh, from the organization Ukraine Trust, Tra Trust Chain, Daniil Cherkovsky and uh, Natalia uh, Mitsuta. Uh, Daniil is, uh, founded Ukraine Trust Chain shortly after the start of Russia's invasion uh, and to fund volunteer teams uh, in the Ukrainian frontline cities. Uh, to date, Trust, Ukraine Trust Chain has raised and deployed uh, over a half a million dollars, funding more than uh, 26,000 evacuations, providing humanitarian aid to thousands of people weekly. Uh, previously, Daniel was a chief analytics officer of Showing Time, a prominent real estate tech firm that was acquired by Zillow in 2021, and he remains the director of analytics for Zillow Group. Uh, and Natalia, Natalia was a successful realtor and the vice president of regional development for the Association of Real Estate Professionals of Ukraine. And currently she is located in Ukraine running um, as part of uh, the Ukraine Trust Chain Group, a large volunteer team, um, and um, uh, recently registered the Wishna Volunteer Center and uh, has now been recognized as one of the preeminent forces in humanitarian relief efforts to help Ukraine. So we have a lot of people here who are uh, able to speak uh, really from personal experience to the, to the things that are happening and um, uh, with in are either currently in Ukraine or recently were in Ukraine and so can give us information about what really is needed from the front lines. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to you, Timothy, to start us off. And um, uh, just a, a quick forward to everybody. Uh, I've said to all our panelists that, you know, we'd like them to speak broadly about uh, international aid to Ukraine and what's needed. And that may include things like what governments are doing and what the UN's doing, um, but that we also know that there's many people, presumably among those who are watching, who themselves want to help. Um, but it's a complicated situation when you look at the, the, the numerous organizations organizations that are out there uh, who are doing donations and collecting donations. And it'd be very helpful if they can also give us some sense of, of how for people like us who are sitting here in the US wanting to donate, what's the best way to do it? What's most needed? How do we pick the best organizations and so on? All of that would be something that I'd really hope that we can all get out of this event. But um, we'll turn it over to you, Timothy, and, and um, you speak to what you think is important. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll uh, name right away seven. Um, metrics uh, or principles that one could think of to organize the thoughts about whether to give a specific organization or not. One is most important, the bottleneck should be money. So in that sense, uh, we shouldn't be given to organizations where uh, that are sitting already on money or they are not, uh, they don't know what they are doing with the money. And uh, in other words, or from the other perspective, these organizations, they, they have the supply chain under control and they have a spare capacity there. They just need more resource. So the marginal dollar, the impact of the marginal dollar you give will be immediately converted into something. Okay, they, they have figured everything out except that they need money, okay? That's one. Number two, zero overheads or close to zero overheads. At the same time, don't be naive about it. They should demonstrate how they pay the staff and logistics. So, you know, realistically, we should be expecting one, 2% overheads. Uh, maybe 3%, but uh, this should not be companies uh, which are 
you know, collecting 50% or 60% overheads. For example, I recently got a grant from a university, by the way, in the United States, very well-meaning. Everyone was excited. And by, by the time it got to the Kiev School of Economics, uh, to the dismay of the staff and faculty at that university, the rules of the university allow Ukrainian people, scholars, to get not more than 40% of that. So, you know, because there are rules, there are overheads, there are things, and no one cares if it's a war or not, there are rules. So, so no overheads, that's number two. Number three, this is a Ukrainian institution operating in Ukraine. Number four, uh, should be sending things to the front lines, if it's talking about assistance to the uh, war affected areas, uh, should be sending assistance immediately to the scholars, directly if it's talking about uh, uh, academic support if it's talking about refugees should be sending money and support immediately to refugees wherever they are so whatever is the purpose of the organization it has to be operating immediately with the end user of the support at the same time number four is going to be that you want to make sure that the governance of this organization is clear so there is a board, there is some kind of principles of decision-making, uh, there is a legal entity behind that. Number five, all the proceeds go to um, formal accounts. They, are, uh, they can be audited later, or it's better if they are audited num, uh, now. And the remaining two would be that they, are, uh, they don't have much inventory. So it's the, uh, the, the other side of the coin of sitting on the money. They also are not sitting on the uh, on these uh, supplies, right? They immediately distribute the, the supplies. So they, they move quickly. And, and finally, um, they are formalized, institutionalized or moving towards that. So it's a longer run effort. Uh, and you, it's not just enthusiasts, but these are enthusiasts who, who will be there for years and they will learn. And what they, they are learning now will be helpful for Ukraine tomorrow the day after tomorrow and in, year, in the years to come. So uh, this, these are more or less principles that uh, we are thinking about when we're recommending um, other institutions or charitable foundations or volunteer projects and efforts to our partners or we're choosing the collaborations. So these are, these are the, you know, depending there are five main principles and two, three principles. That's, that's what I have seen uh, in terms of waste and abuse, you know, are they, uh, not audited, and therefore sometimes, you know, I'll give you specific examples. I've worked with a, uh, with a very prominent uh, NGO, and their overheads were 60%, you know, from 50, 60%. That's not the typical. Another example, I've worked with a company, uh, again, very prominent Ukrainian company, but they were Ukrainian NGO, but they would uh, simply use private accounts, you know, and then at some point they asked me to return money to the private accounts, and I asked them to issue me a letter requesting that they didn't issue the letter, and then they forget about some of the money was in crypto, and they, they basically don't have control over their finances because they just swamped with this. So the tons of examples like that, uh, you, you really want to make it as institutionalized, as professional, but at the same time, it's zero overheads and uh, really tailored to specific needs. So that's, that's kind of general principles. Specifically, what we do at the Kiev School of Economics, uh, I guess we were fast enough to start fundraising immediately on the second day of the war. On the, the war started on the 21st of February. On the 26th of February, we already had the fundraising page up. We, our story was that we just wanted uh, to raise $100,000 for our graduates and students and staff who were enlisting in the military at that point. Over the day or two, we raised maybe a million or two and we realized that you know this, there is a demand uh, and people are willing to give. So we, we decided to raise 5 million. Then we uh, realized that it should be 10, then 15, at this point at 25. So far we have raised $23 million. The strategy there was that uh, we are very quick with payments and we are very good with paperwork and we are very good with deliveries. So these are the three services we can guarantee to people. And that creates credibility with, uh, with, you know, with serious donors. Um, we, however, have been able to, and have been forced in many ways to pivot multiple times. So in the first days of the war, 
we were mostly providing uh, bulletproof vests, protective kits, uh, helmets to paramedics, to military, to territorial defense, to everyone. Later, there was a huge demand for medical kits when there were massive shellings and people were dying from blood loss. And we continue to do that. But over the last two weeks, we had to pivot into providing cars, providing uh, ambulances, providing, um, providing uh, drones um, and um, infrared uh, readers. So this is what we see how the demand is changing. And we, uh, in, in practice, we pivot every two, three weeks. Uh, this is part of the effort, which is related to the war. Um, then the second part of the effort is related to humanitarian relief. We, in the liberated areas, in the areas which are now under control, we provide medical support, we provide uh, electricity generators, food, other things. This is a smaller effort because usually what's needed is people rather than supply. supplies are cheap or supplies are donated. We don't need money for that, uh, but we are engaged in that. Uh, we also uh, have two uh, kind of interesting projects. One is called Seeds for Ukraine. This is where Western companies, European companies in particular, but also Canadian companies donate seeds and we distribute these seeds in Ukraine to farmers, to people, so they can have some, some you know, vegetables, some food, some grains. Um, so the, right now is the sowing, it's planting season. So we distribute that. And it's, it's a fantastic and very interesting effort. And another effort is uh, we partnered up with a Fozzi group. It's a major retail. Those of us in Ukraine know Silpo. And so we help them uh, to bring from Germany and elsewhere humanitarian food. And this food is freely distributed to everyone who needs it in uh, supermarkets uh, uh, around across Ukraine. And they have uh, brought this in this way over a thousand uh, tons by now. It's not much, well, it's a lot, but it's not much on the scale of the, of the country, but it is needed. So we engage in those projects. And finally, the third one is more of our core. Um, it's uh, cultural diplomacy and scholastic diplomacy. We're we are trying to raise money to support Ukrainian scholars who are in Ukraine and also to support, uh, support Ukrainian students who want to go and study for a year or two outside of Ukraine with the hope of coming back later to rebuild the country. So these are three directions that we have. The total revenues that we raised are about $23 million uh, and uh, in-kind revenues probably another 10 or 15. Um, I think it helps that we're very institutionalized and we have a fantastic team of volunteers who are professionals, about 60 to 80 people are working on all of this all over the world. And without them, it wouldn't be possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we really appreciate you joining us. We can see that you're, you're in a car. And, and for anybody who's been following Timothy on Twitter or other social media, you've seen that he is regularly in a car these days, um, moving all over Ukraine. Um, so we really appreciate you finding time. Um, Don, we're going to turn it over to you. Um, and Don, also somebody who you'll see uh, if you follow him on Twitter all over, all over the globe and uh, recently uh, in or near uh, Poland and Ukraine. Um, I met Don uh, when I was doing research in 2016-17 in Ukraine. And as soon as I, I got on social media, I tried to avoid it, but I was on it as soon as this war began. And I saw him on the border of Poland. And I know since then you've been in Ukraine, Don. Um, we'll turn it over to you to share what you've been doing and what you can uh, give to our audience about uh, what you think about international aid and what they can do to help. Uh, sure. Well, what I've been doing is the opposite end of the spectrum. It's uh, basically I set up an off the books uh, operation. Basically, I deployed myself out to eastern Ukraine, teamed up with uh, some old friends from Ukraine, including a former ambassador and uh, the former deputy head of uh, Donetsk Oblast, uh, Yevgeny Volinsky, and basically looked at how we could rush in necessary supplies and fundraise. So. I've been able to get, I don't know, 100 and some um, uh, thousand US dollars in, in terms of equipment. Uh, my week is completely the same, beg for money, do media appearances to beg for money, get the money, scrounge around to try and procure whatever I can lay my hands on. And exactly the same cycle as what Timothy said, right? First it was protective gear, that was the number one request. And now it's shifted over to specialized things for, for the units that I supply, mostly tier one units. And so it's looking at optics, uh, thermal vision, drones, and, and things like that. So the needs have shifted. And cars. Uh, everybody wants cars. Uh, and so 
the 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 needs have, have shifted a bit. And so what we're trying to do is I collect the gear, drive it over the border, either deliver it myself um, or, or team up with other people who then deliver it to immediately to the front lines. So keeping an absolutely streamlined supply chain in which we procure and hand it directly to units. Why do I do it this way? Well, it's very simple uh, because the bulk of humanitarian and military assistance is still sitting in Western Ukraine and Kiev. That's just the reality of it. And those are the official statistics out of the Ukrainian government saying that 77% of all uh, assistance was sitting in Lutsk, Lviv, ivano frankivsk and Kiev. So this is the problem is getting the stuff to the frontline units, which just don't have it. Now, you can argue for a long time why this problem exists and who's responsible and everything else. But this is an exact replication of what we saw in the Donbass. So as I was advising Volinsky, uh, in Donetsk Oblast, we had exactly the same problems. There was hoarding of uh, humanitarian supplies. There was failure of international organizations to deliver. And for me, this is the greatest crime that we've seen is in the first six weeks uh, of, the current, uh, of the current part of the conflict, where have all the internationals been? So I'm, I spent a week in Kiev. I saw one international vehicle driving around including through Irpin and Bucha and everywhere else. You see World Central Kitchen, you don't see much of anybody else. So where the hell have the internationals been? And this is something where they have collected hundreds of millions in donations and we're sitting on it. And this is where I was sort of trolling the, the Canadian-based organizations, asking them a very simple question. What percentage of the money collected have you actually deployed to operations in Ukraine? And they would never answer that question straightly. It was always about, we give it to partners, we're doing this, we're, what percentage of that is actually going? So with the Canadian Red Cross, they collected hundreds of millions of dollars and only a small percentage was getting to Ukrainian Red Cross or to actual operations on the ground. Uh, and I cross the border all the time. So I see exactly what's going on in the border. So you see what's happening. And I've crossed it just about every way you can, except for on a pogo stick or on an e-scooter. So last time I went by on foot, uh, you could just see that the tents for refugees are just completely empty except for Caritas, World Central Kitchen, and a couple of European NGOs, mostly Polish NGOs who are on the ground helping. So where have all the international organizations been with their hundreds of millions of donations? And this is a big issue. And again, this was exactly a replication of what we saw in Donbass. So there are big problems in terms of the international assistance. I applaud Timothy for what he's doing because he sees the way forward is that this is gonna shift now from immediately supplying the military to dealing with the rebuilding. But what did we learn from the Donbass? So as soon as uh, President Poroshenko announced that he was going to give billions in uh, rebuilding uh, money to the Donetsk, you can actually look on Facebook and there were guys who had gathered at the local uh, economic boss in Lugansk and were rubbing their hands together, coming up with schemes. And what was the topic of discussion? How we can screw ProZoro to make sure that none of our schemes are detected. As I've said, uh, just because the devil came to Ukraine doesn't mean that everybody turned into angels overnight. So what we're seeing now is that all of the same problems in terms of governance and delivery and everything else are still there. So somehow there has to be order brought to this. And unfortunately, the international organizations are not being the grown-ups in the room. So these problems are gonna have to be solved by Ukrainians themselves because there is no real leadership from the international community on this. They themselves have shown that they're completely incompetent of being able to actually deploy to a European country to deliver assistance. And I've just asked myself one simple question. Why is this conflict so unique? You can go to Darfur, you can go to anywhere, you can go to anywhere in the world and deploy into a war zone. But for some reason, it took two months for the main international organizations to get their act together. Where have they been? Why, why is it so difficult? Why couldn't you be on the Polish border? So this for me raises a lot of very serious questions. The other side of it is how is the money for the rebuilding going to go? And Timothy hit a right on the head. One of the big issues is agriculture. The fact that, uh, the, that you have a blockade of all the ports and you're unable to ship out most of the agricultural shipments except now through Eastern Europe uh, and continually, this is why, for example, the Russians are trying to hit the, the bridge uh, uh, that, that leads out of, uh, out of Odessa is, is one of the things that they're trying to look at, right? Zatoka was a very nice summer place, but that bridge is, is one of the main conduits. There's ways around it, but still. So we, and the same thing that I was shocked the most about in my, in my uh, traveling around to the newly liberated areas. 
that there was specifically Russian targeting of the industrial base. Factory after factory and large plants and everything else have been hit continually. So there is a dedicated program to destroying the industrial base of Ukraine. Somebody's going to have to pay for it. Uh, it's definitely not going to be Russia because I don't think after this conflict, they're going to be able to do much with uh, bear pelts and uh, amber uh, to be able to, to do any reparation. So it's going to have to come from the international community. Um, and this is one of the things that they've started to look at. So this current fighting between um, major international organizations and the Ukrainian government of who's going to lead this is a serious issue. We need to learn the lessons of Donbass and things like Afghanistan reconstruction. And we need to somehow sideline all of the malfeasance that went on in those programs. Otherwise, it's going to become a huge disaster. Ukraine's going to win the war but lose the peace in terms of not being able to rebuild quickly enough. right? And so this is one of the things that we need to look at is how can we quickly rebuild? How can those resources be used to, for example, to kickstart the agricultural market? How are we going to kickstart all of these other plants? that are either gonna to have to be relocated to Western Ukraine if the conflict uh, drags on or immediately rebuilt. Um, and these are some of the problems that we had for the last eight years and none of them were, were sufficiently uh, resolved. Uh, I, I'm very sad to say, but the anti-corruption work needs to start now. Um, so that's one of the things in my, my future life uh, I'm gonna be looking at in terms of setting up an organization, Ukraine Aid Watch, to be able to, to start to look at this. So yeah. That's my two cents from the fantastic and um, a uh, number of questions and I, and I want to get to uh, Daniel and, and Natalia but I see uh, Timothy is you, you have a hand up do you want to do a quick comment on this before we go to Daniel. Yeah, I just want to uh, just clarify one thing on the number of 77% uh, of um, the humanitarian aid uh, stain so I cannot speak for everything but I just uh, to put it in the perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen the uh, the warehouses full in uh, Lviv, uh, but they're not full of um, the items that we need to ship. So they're mm -hmm. not full of uh, uh, protective gear or they're not full of cellux, uh, but they are full of things. So it's not clear who needs them, like, you know, toilet paper or, uh, you, know, bears. Okay, uh, um, you know, there are tons of, you know, like, Okay, pumpers perhaps people are needed. You know, need that. I, I, you know, I'm not denying this, but there are tons of clothing. You know, really yeah. like a, people donated a lot of clothing, and I've seen you know floors of this. This is sitting, and it's uh, the second problem. It's not sorted, mm -hmm. so it's not sorted, which means no one has the capacity to sort it, and it's probably going to be sitting that until the end of the war. So we need to separate this desire to give the warm glow in the West just to give something or to donate money to someone to give something. And then the, what's really needed on the front lines. There is, uh, on the corruption side, let's discuss that later, how we can approach it. But, you know, I just want to clarify that probably of this 77%, I am yet to find any Celex in Lviv. And I've driven myself physically because I need that. Uh, and it's not there. So, so it's the type of aid. Uh, it might be also reflective of the fact that what's being sent is wasteful. I, I'm not. I'm not saying. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't send, don't send what uh, you know help to Ukraine. But just make sure it's needed and it's tailored uh, to to specific needs, and you have an end user. Thank you so yeah, no, much, Timothy. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right about that. And this has been one of the things that I I saw in terms of here in Canada. People were collecting clothes and everything else. All right. Uh, and I've said this that you're going to put that into a shipping container and ship it. You're going to send food to Ukraine in a shipping container, and it'll take months to get there. Far cheaper to buy it in Poland and actually deliver it in. You don't need to send shipping containers of food and old clothes to Ukraine. That's not going to help anybody. I agree absolutely on that. Yeah. Thank you both. And I want to get back to a number of things you have raised, but let's give uh, Daniil and Natalia um, a couple of minutes to discuss what uh, your organization, Ukraine Trust Chain, has been doing. And uh, certainly, in addition to that, if you'd like to touch on any of these questions and issues that uh, Timothy and, and, and uh, Don have raised, that'd be fantastic as well. I'll turn it over to you, Daniil. Great. Um, thanks for um, having us on this panel. It's a great honor to be here. Um, Natalia is in Kiev. I am in, in Evanston, so definitely I feel that we are specifically here to support Natalia and, and people like her um, 
So I just don't want to take too much time from from the limited time we have so that Natasha has as much time to uh, express what she sees on the ground. I'll comment on a couple of things. Um, um, our, on our side, uh, we, I'm a grassroots organization who so haven't had a, you know, an extended experience in the kind of public policy space or in, in fundraising prior to this. However, what we had is connections with uh, the Ukrainian community going into this and various connections on the US side with the networks that were willing to give money but couldn't find the right way to apply it. Initially, talk to people, they are, they feel bad and they mention large organizations that actually have nothing to do actually with Ukraine, uh, that they're given money to, you know, to just um, to address kind of the need to give something in this critical state. So what, um, and of course, the amount of money that we started raising, by now it's uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, but initially it wasn't clear how much we'll be able to raise. So it was important to find a direct point of application for these funds that will be effective. And I think what we found an, an efficient way to do this was that from the first days of the war, we found, we came into contact using our community connections with the layer of people who provide the last mile logistics on the ground, which are Ukrainian volunteers that stayed behind in frontline cities under bombing, right? Which already raises the, it's, it's a form of integrity filter, just whoever is driving under the city, in the city under fire, right? Whoever is finding the time to get to the elderly, to bring them aid, and if you're, in constant communication with them, that provides you a certain level of trust that you could leverage. And so it was, you could leverage to convince people in the US that this is a real reason to give it. Um, and so what we've been working on, right, is uh, on my organization works with, Natalia Mitsuda has a flagship team, but there is a number of teams um, in Ukraine, Many of them were referred to us by Natasha or by the people that we subsequently started to work with after Natasha referred them to us and they recommended other volunteer organizations that they see on the ground doing the real work in the last mile delivery. And we're providing funds uh, to that group. So these are the trucks that are actually going to Irpin, trucks that actually went to Bucha, Baradyanka, Kastomil, Mashun, they're going to Chernigov area and so forth. Um, so that layer of this relief effort is extremely important because I believe those are the main organizations that actually end up given the aid or the materials that everybody sources to the elderly, to the family with kids and the people who organize refugee centers in Dnipro and so forth. Um, as well as driving evacuation efforts. The teams we fund as of today evacuated 30,500 people. So it's not a, a small effort. There, is a, there are people, there are three teams that do those evacuations. So it's very efficient. And I think there's a question of how much this could be scaled. However, the network of trusted volunteers is fairly large. And the volunteers that have had a track record and are recognized as volunteers in their communities are connected with other adjacent volunteer groups. And uh, the great thing about this is that when you give them funds directly without really giving them the materials or spend money outside, then the volunteers find ways to use the funds. If they are able to source some humanitarian aid from Lviv, then they just spend the money on gas to get that uh, cargo somewhere. If they need to buy some medication, then they have the money to use it there, but they then don't need to spend it on food. They're also able to put together efforts to buy a truck of produce to get it to one of the Kiev restaurants that just provides free meals to everyone, kind of uh, scaling that effort. So I think uh, the layer of citizen volunteers in Ukraine 
is has been extremely important in delivering in in the last mile uh, delivery of of uh, of this aid. This is what we've been focusing on, and I also want to add an important aspect of it is that the communication and feeling connection with this layer really helps raise awareness of the situation in Ukraine in the West. It is very easy for someone in the West to connect to a family receiving this aid, right? So this is, this is something that doesn't require a lot of convincing to do, as long as you provide transparency and a sustained flow of this and good accountability. That's the last part is what is difficult at times because this the volunteers are driving around, they're at guest stations, right? They have to split teams and go in different directions because the roads are, you know, are not in great shape and because you it's hard to source gas, paper cash, and so forth. So this is the area that is complex, but it is the way we address it is first by working continuously to improve reporting system and at the same time um, providing a sustained narrative where people are not just following a general mass of people but are able to follow a specific team day in day out they can track their progress over time so they can see exactly the efforts that the different teams are involved in and these teams are not necessarily small some of them involve 70 100 people right and all of them operating without getting any money this organization is run in the u.s by uh former immigrants from from ukraine and other uh, places that are just like me are professionals in the u.s that feel the need to help and so we're doing this free of cost and are able to maintain zero overhead that timothy mentioned about so um the, there's a question of how to scale that aid and i think we need structures that will unite volunteers right but but it, a lot of it is based on the reputation of a given volunteer group within its community a lot of them haven't had a chance to create a formal uh charity foundation within ukraine because as you know there was a period when the the registries was closed in Kiev. You needed to go to Vinnytsia to register your organization, and that, on its own, you know, whether you do you want to do that or do you want to actually take a truck and use the money that you get from the U.S. to to get that aid to someone in the front lines. That's kind of the choice that people had. So, but right now that we're we're seeing changes and an evolution of that structure going in the right direction with more collaboration between the teams and um i think listening to volunteers is very important especially those that have the the track record and can tell you what's needed in the last mile of the logistics chain um that's kind of what we've been focusing on and we found that we can make a huge impact impact with the funds that you know are not that large compared to what larger international organizations are able to to collect that's kind of my point on this yeah fantastic and you're going to uh, translate for natalia i understand is that right yes i'll be happy to do so Hello, I'm Natalia Mitsuta from the first days of the war. I am in Kyiv. Before the war, I never uh, did any volunteer work and didn't even know about any volunteer foundation, charity foundations, because there was no need uh, for me to participate in those. When I, I started the, uh, my volunteer work, uh, when there was an acute need on the ground, uh, especially when the evacuation from European started. Uh, 
заключалась в том, что в самые, в самые острые бои выводили людей. И это не было организованная эвакуация. какими-то коридорами. Это были обычные водили. Наташа, там прервалась ненадолго. But uh, during the most uh, during the battles for Irpin, um, people were evacuated, and it wasn't uh, and nobody was evacuated in an organized way. There were no corridors, and the evacuations happened. Извини, интернет прервался где-то там. Можешь повторить, как проходили uh, эвакуации? В тот момент не было еще ничего. То есть это были первые острые бои. И люди, обычные люди своими машинами вывозили других людей. Они возвращались каждый раз. In the first ними. days of, of fighting, uh, there was no organization, so private citizens were evacuating people using their own vehicles from European. Первая просьба поступила о том, чтобы добавить, не было денег на заправку. Они сюда приезжали, заправляли, и они обратно ехали за людьми. The first request that came, uh, people didn't have money for fuel. They were getting people in, coming to Kiev, unloading them, and then they didn't have fuel to go back, and they wanted to go back to European. То есть это были первые моменты, когда мы вошли в процесс помощи эвакуации людей. То есть мы финансово э, помогали заправлять эти автомобили, потому что э, людей не так много было, таких, которые не боялись ехать, эвакуировать под бомбежками. This was the first time that we became, uh, that we became involved in evacuations uh, when we started providing money to the vehicles that needed to be fueled to evacuate people from Irpin, because there weren't a lot of people that were willing to undertake such dangerous mission. So, I say this all to me, that our work started with the need here and now. So, we didn't have time to search for the foundation. I, I, I'm saying this because I just want to stress that Our work started from an acute need here and now, where we didn't have time to look for organizations or foundations. Поэтому только благодаря тому, что Ukrainian Trust Change нам давали деньги, мы могли этим людям на карточку бросать деньги, и они могли заправлять свои автомобили. То есть это то, что с чего мы начинали. So that's what we started with, with the money that Ukraine trust chain was finally to us. We were able to fill up the Grivna cards that people are using to fill their car, their cars. That's what started this process. Потом забирали к себе. У меня дома ночевало четыре семьи. То есть в разном периоде они ночевали. Мне некуда было их девать. И я их везла к себе. So initially some people that were evacuated were going to the to the hospitals. Извините, um, что подержалась. But my understanding is there was a not always it was clear where the families could actually stay. And so Natasha herself even had to host four families at her home uh, just to, to give them some place to stay. И это я говорю к тому, как развивалась наша организация. У нас за неделю образовалась группа из 70 человек, таких же, как и я, людей, которые ранее этим не занимались. Это люди, которые готовы были брать переселенцев к себе. Это люди, которые были ехать за переселенцами, то есть, вернее, эвакуировать людей. То есть это те люди, которые не боялись перемещаться под обстрелами. Um, yeah, so I, I'm explaining this just how this organization started. So initially it came from the need here and now and Within a week, we had an organization of about 70 people just like me. And those were the people that were willing to accept refugees into their homes, 
drive and those were the people that weren't afraid to move around under enemy fire within the city. В этот период в Киеве образовалась продовольственная блокада. То есть у нас магазины не работали, хлеба не было, и в течение трех дней мы наладили систему, когда начали печь хлеб, пирожки, нам мы нашли помещение, это было в одной из школ, нам дали кухню, нашли человека, который может печь хлеб и развозили людям. So initially, the, in, at that time, there was a three-day period when there was a food blockade uh, within Kiev, where there wasn't, the bread wasn't getting to Kiev stores. So at that time, we've organized our own kitchen to make bread. We used the school kitchen to uh, prepare bread and pirashki and other things that we were then producing at a larger scale and distributing it to railroad station and to private citizens. И, и опять же к тому, как мы осваивали деньги, то есть на эти деньги мы помимо хлеба находили магазины, которые работают и покупали продукты. То есть мы не только хлеб возили. Благодаря тому, что у нас за неделю образовалась команда в 70 человек, мы заняли несколько направлений. То есть у нас в течение месяца, когда у нас в Киеве была проблема с э, питанием, э, мы накормили около двух с половиной тысяч э, людей, в основном это люди э, в возрасте и мамы с детками. Mm -hmm. So, uh, initially, uh, we were also using the funds, we were finding stores that had some products available and were buying that with the funding that we have. Since we had 70 people involved, we were able to pursue several directions. In particular, we were focusing on feeding the elderly and uh, mothers with kids. And in that week, we fed roughly 2,500 people in Kyiv. В этот момент э, пожилые люди сильно нуждались в лекарствах. То есть это было 90% из тех, кому мы приезжали, они нуждались в жизненно важных лекарствах. Э, находя эти лекарства... At, at that point, uh, elderly знаю, people одна needed была аптека, of... две. Elderly people needed uh, medications. About 90% of elderly people that we visited needed uh, medications, and we were sourcing those. И в этот момент мы uh, еще одно направление uh, открыли по поиску медикаментов. Для этого нам нужны были деньги, потому что медикаменты искали как и в Киеве, так и в других городах. И пробовали это довести, чтобы uh, доставить этим людям. Это были в основном люди с защитовидной so, железой, это были люди после инсульта. Uh, for medicine, for medication within Kiev and outside of it for elderly people were primarily primarily helping people with uh, serious health conditions, people after stroke and so forth. And the medicine had to be sourced as within Kiev and outside of Kiev. В одномоментно происходило, не, одномоментно происходило несколько процессов. Это мы развозили сухпайки и лекарства людям домой. То есть мы, у нас было несколько людей, которые машинами развозили адресно. Следующий – это мы пекли пирожки, хлеб, возили это, на, это все питание возили на ЖД вокзал в момент, когда с Харькова, с Чернигова эвакуировали людей. So, Этих людей привозили на ЖД вокзал yeah, uh, и so мы we were, we were... возили им. So we were we were uh, focusing on several directions again. We were delivering food and medicine directly to uh, out of the volunteer base that we had. We were they, uh, there were people driving food to the specific addresses where we've identified that had residents in need. At the same time, we continued to produce food and delivering it to the railroad uh, to the Kiev railroad station, where a lot of refugees from Chernigov and other places were stationed just staying within the railroad and needed to be fed. We were delivering uh, 
food that we were preparing in our kitchens to those people. В этот же момент мы наладили приготовление горячих обедов. Это было два ресторана, которые с нами сотрудничали, где работали волонтеры. Мы им завозили продукты, и они готовили горячие обеды на больнице, врачам и на тероборону. И точно так же возили и инвалидам, то есть в дома инвалидов возили. Но это в общей сложности где-то около тысячи человек мы кормили горячими обедами. So, uh, we were also preparing, uh, Это уже группа людей. То есть... Yeah, we were, we were also set up, uh, there were two restaurants that we were collaborating with that uh, provided food for the territorial defense for forces, for hospitals, for elderly, and we were feeding a thousand people. Uh, в этот момент uh, были жуткие обстрелы Чернигова, и uh, к нам приезжали uh, военные иногда, или такие же волонтеры, uh, ну, которые просто не боялись ехать и возили еду uh, в заблокированный Чернигов. Uh, они довозили тоже, мы нашли там волонтерский центр, куда мы все, все отправляли, и они там разносили людям. Люди получали по одной сосиске, и по 200 грамм сахара, потому что привезти so, очень много мы не могли. Выезжали туда люди на небольших машинах, это люди, которые просто не боялись. В ином случае просто никто не хотел ехать в этот период. Yeah, so we were, uh, at that time when there were the uh, bombing of Chernigov intensified, uh, we there were a few brave people that were willing to drive. This was an extremely dangerous mission that very few people were able to do on smaller cars. So we were we started delivering packages to Chernigov to people in dire need. A, a person would get one sausage and 200 grams of sugar usually. That was the package that people were receiving because we couldn't ship uh, food in larger quantities because of how dangerous it was and how limited the supply of drivers willing to take that path was at the moment. Я рассказываю вам все, что происходило в один момент. Это делала группа людей. Good question. I just just a comment. If, yep. Um, uh, Если у людей будут какие-то вопросы, ответы, нам э, просто, чтобы оставить время на это, тоже попросили организаторы. Mm -hmm. yeah. Да, хорошо. Yeah. Uh, uh, я сейчас хочу сказать о том, насколько сильно развилась наша сеть, потому что именно из-за того, что мы здесь и сейчас слышали проблематику, мы сразу же на это реагировали. Благодаря этому у нас развилось еще несколько направлений. So I just want to stress that our network has really developed because we were responding to the most urgent need as the time goes, our, we, we are able to take on more and more different needs. And so our networks of volunteers has really developed. Все наши действия, они начинались чуть-чуть раньше, чем реагировали большие организации. Our actions always... Our actions always started before larger, uh, usually started a little bit before the point that a larger organization could get involved into a real problem that existed. Ну, во-первых, у них, скорее всего, не всегда были ресурсы доправить, и я имею в виду человеческий ресурс, люди, которые не боялись ехать в эти места. И уже спустя какое-то время они... Yeah, they often lacked just the human resources, people that were willing, uh, that would be willing to go where, where people needed to go. They just didn't have the large organization, might not have the people willing to go to, to the dangerous places to deliver the, the aid. Уже после освобождения Чернигова и Киевской области, только через два дня, когда нас смогли провести военные, Мы заехали со своими продуктами. И еще несколько, несколько организаций, которые, вот, к примеру, в Ирпине, это сделала мэрия. Но в маленьких селах туда не доезжали около недели. То есть туда никто еще не ехал. 
So what we were helping is in the liberated Kiev and Chernigov region, for example, the, we were able to get into the uh, Buchigastomil two days after the, the liberation, but there are smaller villages in that area waited more than a week to get any aid delivered to those villages as well, which is what uh, our organization was doing. Mm -hmm. Вся продукция, которая ехала, уже большие машины от организаций, которые приходили с Запада, с Америки, то есть иностранных организаций, они в основном были наполнены сухпайками. И первыми там гигиена, шампуни, много таких вещей, которые нужны, но они второстепенны. Uh, so uh, the uh, the packages that were arriving were uh, continued to arrive were was food and so forth and and hygienic products which wasn't the main the most important items right at the after the first couple of days for those regions. Right. Uh, то есть это были не, не то, что я, было, расскажу, я сейчас продолжу, да. К чему? То есть, когда мы заезжали на территорию, в Америке никто не знал, что нужны свечи. В Америке или в Европе никто не знал, что нужны э, спички. То есть те вещи, которые э, из-за того, что не было электричества, никто нам не отправлял тогда генераторов. Мы эти генераторы сами и сами искали и покупали. Уже после, когда прошло несколько времени, там неделя, безусловно, начали привозить генераторы. Но в первые дни э, эти машины не были наполнены генераторами. Yeah. Candles, matches, for example, just something that wouldn't occur to uh, to external to the, to the Americans. That that's what was needed, and so we switched to bringing in generators and and so and, and other items that were needed. Daniel, so, yeah. Daniel, this is uh, fantastic, and I, the the detail you're able to to convey is amazing. Um, I do want to get uh, our other panelists back in, and also make sure we get a chance to get the audience to be able to ask you. We got some questions coming in about the work you guys are doing. Uh, maybe just one more word, Natalia, and then um, we can switch over to Q and A, and and you can share some more of this, but in the context of specific questions. Может быть, вы могли бы э, небольшое завершение и дальше люди будут задавать вопросы, и тогда вы сможете прокомментировать детально по тем вопросам, которые люди будут задавать. Хорошо. Я это все рассказала только для того, насколько правильно и рационально мы распоряжаемся тем, той помощью, теми деньгами, которые мы получаем. То есть мы очень благодарны за огромную помощь других стран, Америки, Канады, Европы. Это все приходит, это все доходит до людей. Но когда ты приезжаешь и привозишь банан или свежее яблоко, или свежую колбасу, молоко и творог, этого не может быть в гуманитарной помощи, потому что это скоро портящие все продукты. То есть таких, такой потребности, к сожалению, с Америки не закрыть. То есть я сейчас говорю о таком самом базовом наборе продуктов питания, которые люди, в которых они нуждаются. Okay. So I just want to stress how efficient we are at distributing this aid. We're very grateful for the aid coming in from Поэтому... the West. So, but uh, the but what we are able to provide bananas, cottage cheese, other things that are impossible to bring from the outside, and that's you should see how important it is to people receiving this, how, how crucial it is to receive help like that as well on the ground. So that final word or? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we'll get. We'll definitely come back to you in a, in a moment. Uh, thank you, everybody. This is this is fantastic, and I want to remind people who are watching that uh, please put your uh, questions in the Q and A as some of you are starting to do. Uh, and um, we definitely um, there's a question just come up right now about providing URLs and contact for some of the um, organizations um, to donate to, and, and I'll certainly put up all three of these organizations. And if any of you have other organizations you'd like us to promote, please, please do so. Um, a, a number of questions um, that are coming up here and also that I'd like to ask all of you, um, but one that's, that's important here uh, is someone's asking, you know, for the volunteers yourselves, 
uh, you're doing so much for other people. How are you managing to support yourselves, your families, um, given that you're full time working? It sounds like uh, for uh, to, you know, for helping others. So, um, I mean, are people still earning salaries of any sort um, in places that you are in terms of your regular salaries from your regular jobs, or um, is aid helping you survive? Um, that's one thing that people are wondering is about you know the volunteers helping others. How do you how do you yourselves get by? Наташа, это вопрос для тебя, наверное, о том, спрашивают о том, волонтеры, которые помогают и тратят всю жизнь на, на помощь другим людям, каким образом вы выживаете, платят ли вам какую-то зарплату, каким образом вы поддерживаете свои собственные семьи, откуда вы находите средства на это для того, чтобы помогать другим людям? Ну, скажем так, что люди разного достатка и по-разному были подготовлены к войне. У кого-то были свои сбережения, и они, помимо того, что могут себя обеспечить, оплачивать коммунальные услуги, оплачивать траты какие-то, которые касаются личной их жизни, а есть люди, которые не готовы были, потому что они там приобрели квартиру или потратились, инвестировали во что-то, остались практически без средств, то есть они не готовы к этому были. На сегодняшний момент, благодаря Даниилу, у меня есть группа людей, которая с первого дня до сегодня работает со мной. И мы заправляем эти машины, то есть заправляем бензин с этих денег. То есть мы обсудили это с Даниилом, потому что огромное количество уходит топлива на эти все движения. Более того, приезжают обстрелянные машины, хотя, хотя есть такие, которые уже около 50 тысяч гривен потратили на, на этот бензин, и они не хотели брать. То есть я им предлагала оплатить этот бензин, они не хотели, они тратили свои деньги. Ну и помимо этого машину их обстреляли. Она oh, сейчас в ремонте. Вот, поэтому oh. основная часть людей отказывается от того, чтобы им оплачивали. People, uh, people, came into the, people that came into the complex were prepared at different levels. Uh, the people that work for me mostly have had some savings that allow them to operate, to pay utilities. Others couldn't uh, sustain it for long because they bought apartments, you know, they were in debt and, and needed to support it. But on our end, uh, Ukraine Trust Chain helps us, you know, provide at least fuel for the cars that people drive that volunteer and, and help out. Um, but most drivers that uh, work with us actually refuse to accept money to fuel their cars for private reasons. Uh, even though it's expensive, they, it continues to be a volunteer effort. Thank you. Uh, Timothy or, or Don, do you, either of you want to speak to, to either of the, to that question or any other things that have come up? Well, what I've been doing is uh, just basically living off of, uh, you know, funds that I had from uh, my previous assignment in the Maldives and, of course, the generosity of my friends who helped in terms of crowdfunding. But, yeah, it's a volunteer activity, so you don't get any salary. Thank goodness my, my wife is working currently. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, we would be able to cover our bills. Just uh, uh, Okay, yeah. Oh, Timothy, uh, please, yes. So... so, so um, First two months, this the rule. I think we've got we've done it through 2014 and others. Uh, we we evaluated in you know with this massive effort that we have, we probably our salary bill would be would have been one million dollars because we had you know people who were sourcing uh, things from London and people who were delivering things in Lviv and so on. Um, so uh, we quickly substituted the team. Uh, once the volunteers start burning out um, with uh, people from Ukraine and we are pushing for large volume. So with one or two percent of uh, administrative costs, uh, we can cover all of the salaries. Uh, we, we kept the salaries uh, at, uh, to everyone at 50,000 hryvnias. That's the highest salary. It doesn't matter how much you earned before the war, but that's your way the salaries are capped. But at the same time, even if you're sitting in London or Vienna, this is your salary. Uh, after that, you volunteer your time. But we pay that. We pay that because we want the effort to be sustainable. We don't want people to burn out. And we also rotate people because, it, you know, they get tired psychologically. So they're on and off. They work a shift of six weeks. 
and then they take a break of two to four weeks and then they work another shift of six weeks. We have a system to keep them to keep them very all the time. At the same time, get some salaries so that then they, they can go on for a while. Timothy, can we get you to speak? I mean, I know Kiev School, uh, Kiev School of Economics has been doing some research on labor markets, and, and uh, Natalia may have, and Don, you, you may have sense of this just from your time in Ukraine. Uh, but aside from volunteer efforts, uh, to what extent are people's jobs, their regular jobs, pre war jobs, still functioning enough to give them salaries? Um, the Kiev School of Economics, Timothy, as I understand, is, is functioning. I know you guys are having events and so on. Uh, I assume your staff still receives their regular work, uh, regular salaries. Is that normal for many organizations in, in Kiev and, and at least the Western part of the country, or is that uh, an exception? Uh, can I go second? I will pull up the data. There was some survey. Sure, of course. Does anyone, uh, Natalia, Daniel, Don, any thoughts on this? Well, I mean, when you look at the labor market, I mean, this is one of the things where, again, where I don't see where the international organizations have understood the need to deploy uh, their people there and employ the IDPs. There's lots of people sitting in Western Ukraine that could be doing things like building housing and getting people secured and everything else. They're, they're bringing in a lot of internationals. And it's the same thing with all of these internationals who are just hanging around in Kiev uh, when you could actually be employing IDPs to do, to do a lot of the work. The same thing with the refugees who are in Poland. You have this tremendous labor pool that is there. And I've been trying to encourage people is that why not employ them? Keep them closer to Ukraine rather than uh, sending them to Canada, America, or the UK or someplace. So you have this. Uh, the business ombudsman, uh, Roman Washuk, has been very effective in, ter in terms of trying to do this himself, looking for possibilities of employing people. So he's trying to get some of the business associations to be very useful. Okay, um, th thank you. I agree with everything you, you just said. Also, I want to kind of complement this and give some data. Uh, what we have done at KC, we have repurposed, uh, reprofiled a lot of our people because we had a lot of administrative assistance, a lot of uh, student support stuff. Of course, we're not doing any uh, teaching offline anymore. So all of these guys basically had the choice for in three months to reprofile uh, re and get on this humanitarian effort or you know, seek at some point some other uh, opportunities. That of course excludes people who are in the front lines, who are, who are in the military or who are in the areas which are occupied. And we have had and some outstanding heroes there, people who, let's say the head of our study, uh, student study support, she was in Sumi during the most horrific events in Sumi. And she continued to run um, both this, uh, her, day job and humanitarian effort. Uh, we are one of the few companies which hired more people during the war because we're growing. Uh, but I have survey data in front of me. Uh, and here is the percentage of uh, uh, salary distribution. 2% of companies on average pay more than before the war. 23%, so total 20, a quarter pays 100%, the same as before the war. The next 30% uh, pay above 50. So. Uh, about 50% pre-war. So if you ask, you know, uh, how many companies pay at least 50% of what they paid before the war, we have 75% of the companies and 20% of the companies don't pay anything. So this is the distribution. Uh, in terms of um, the um, em employment, how many people are employed and what's the degree of the orders that the companies have, we have 13% of companies which work the same as before. 31 of works partly, more or less, and then 27, uh, so a quarter of the companies are um, kind of uh, temporarily inactive and only 6% uh, are closed down permanently. So, so the, the idea here is, I think the broader picture is that uh, two thirds of the companies have adjusted with, uh, uh, and uh, one third is not and shutting down and you almost have a uniform distribution where a third of the companies are doing as well as before the war or even better. Another third is, is closing down and not paying salaries. And another third is somewhere in between struggling and trying to transform and adapt. Thank you. That, that's remarkable that you have uh, this data already, uh, Timothy. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, Natalia. Uh, yeah, I want to ask a question. 
приятно очень слышать о такой системности. Безусловно, когда я начинала заниматься волонтерской деятельностью, никто об этом не думал, и мы не знали, насколько долго это все затянется, и насколько хватит ресурса людей и денег для того, чтобы это делать бесплатно. Поэтому мне ваш опыт очень нужен, скажем так. Если вы поделитесь, каким образом мы сейчас можем выстроить систему и точно так же разобраться с зарплатами, потому что у нас ну, может возникнуть отток нашего людского ресурса. Люди идут на работу. То есть мы их должны удержать. Я вам буду очень признательна, если ну, вы поделитесь своими, своим опытом экономическим. Uh, let me translate the, the question that uh, this is a question to Timofey from Natalia, uh, where um, Timofey, if you could please share uh, your experience in terms of uh, how you organize your organization that, the, uh, that in a way that continues to provide uh, salaries to people and um, because we are worried that on our end, due to burnout and so forth, uh, we will be we will lose a lot of human capital that we now have in our volunteer organizations. I would appreciate if you could share your insight in your experience in this area. I'm going to answer real quick uh, on this, uh, and I'm going to answer it in uh, Ukrainian, and then I might have to disconnect because of something coming up uh, here, and I'll try to connect back in two or three minutes. Ми би дуже хотіли з вами взаємодіяти, те, що я почув, ви прекрасна організація, і ми завжди шукаємо співпрацю з такими організаціями. Тобто давайте після цього ем, розмови якось зв'яжемося і окремо зустрінемося, поговоримо на скайпі або зумі, або персонально, коли я буду в Києві. І ми, можливо, навіть якесь фінансування знайдемо і систему допоможемо, ну, поділимося досвідом, ви самі все зробите. Вот, э, тому що те, що ви робите, це дуже-дуже важливо. І це буде, наприклад, дуже практичний результат того, що ми сьогодні досягли на цій зустрічі. Uh, let me translate it, I suppose, uh, also into English that uh, just, uh, I, Natalia, your organization is doing very important work, and uh, I just suggest that we uh, connect offline after this, where we could connect and see if, uh, since your organization is doing such crucial work in this region, we could find a way to see if we can work together and it might be a great practical outcome of this meeting. Дякую, Тимофій. Я залишу тоді контакти через Джордана, напевно, або тут в чаті напишу і з задоволенням з вами хочу зустрітися. Okay, через Джордана, and uh, let's do it, let's connect through Jordan. I have to run, apologies. Thank you. Of course, Timothy, if you can connect again, then fantastic. Otherwise, yeah, thank I'll you so that. much for your time. We always appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to come back to a, a question, and um, I was certainly hoping we would get Timothy on this, but, but it will, if, if, we, uh, if he comes back, we'll ask him to. Um, and uh, the, the list, but, but all of you, I think, can speak to this as well. Uh, the, the list of um, you know, criteria that Timothy laid out at the beginning uh, about the way to understand if an organization is um, reputable. Uh, I think is, is fantastic and we'll follow up with him for everybody listening. We'll follow up with him uh, to see if they have posted that at Kiev School of Economics. And if not, we will get somebody to write that up and make sure that we with them post that so that's available. But a question that, that I had is uh, in terms of how realistic that type of assessment is for the average person, there's certain things there that you can find quite quickly, right? You can go on a website and see if someone has a board of directors, maybe a little bit about transparency. And uh, one question to you, Daniel, that's coming in is uh, from people watching is, you know, as a new organization, what have you been doing? to manage financial reporting and transparency and things like that. So maybe you can speak to this. Um, but more broadly, some of these other questions about inventory and things like that, that Timothy is talking about, I fully agree that that's, you know, a really great indicator if you have the capacity, uh, you know, as an economist or a consultant or someone to do this type of work. But for those of us who just want to, you know, who, or especially for someone who doesn't know much about the, the conflict at all, but wants to help, uh, what, what types of things can you quickly do to understand if an organization uh, is, is trustworthy or not? Um, and I'll just say one more thing about this and turn it over to you because uh, I take very seriously all of your critiques about uh, that many of you are sharing about the international organizations and, and that was part of the motivation for, for this uh, panel is to, to showcase the type of work that you guys are doing. Um, but the one benefit they have is a brand, right? And, and when there's new organizations popping up that are, it's harder for somebody who doesn't know much to know about the brands um, and the reputation um, and so on. So um, beyond what Timothy said, what should somebody do to know, yes, that's a worthy organization and no, that one is not. 
Um, so I, I think part of that question was directed to me. So let me try to address. Yes, a couple please, of things. please. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, um, I yeah, as I mentioned, I I haven't uh, really had experience vetting uh, charitable organizations. So I don't think I can speak to how best select organization uh, that is trusted. It is definitely I can see as a founder of a relative as of a like brand new young organization here that that it is definitely a, a challenge from multiple perspective um, just from the fact that irs is backed up and just getting tax exempt status takes six to nine months potentially right now so whoever started after the war just not able to have the right status with irs to receive donor advised funds and which is often a no-go for corporate match and other programs, right? Where it creates this disconnect of people wanting to help very real organizations, but many of those are very new, right? And, th and that creates a structural difficulty for us. Um, so uh, what we've been doing on, uh, on reporting primarily, right? Is, as I mentioned, in our case, we really, uh, we see our mission, right, in creating a trust-based connection between the donor and the receiver. So what we do is we we are implanted in the communities that we're in, in the professional networks. I work for Zillow. You know, I you can look up my professional work. I'm connected to my professional networks, and the people that I'm connected to, they each reach out in their areas. And as that uh, kind of energy accumulates, at the same time, we're being we're trying to show as much as possible on the work of specific teams. And in this case, these are not just random pictures. You can actually trace a team if you get involved, which is usually the level uh, for higher donation where you would want to understand it. You can track a specific team. We're very transparent in terms of coming to talk to you having a connection with you, getting a direct word from the team uh, you trust if you make a larger donation and so forth. So that's that's kind of the way that, uh, so we focus on trust primarily in this case. I, I understand that it's the benefit of being a somewhat smaller organization compared to larger scale, but under the circumstances, again, it allowed us still to fund 30,000 evacuations, which is not a small number um, by any means. So, in terms of financial reporting, we are uh, being transparent internally. Just it's important to understand that for there are so many different interpretations of whether uh, whether it's an organization that is large enough or small enough when it comes to messaging that it is not always clear whether uh, pushing financial metrics in public reporting is really something that helps get more money for the volunteers in Ukraine. Like I could say that we've rate we've all by now we've deployed six hundred thirty thousand dollars. For some people, that might seem oh that's a lot, so they've gotten enough money for a small organization. We're not going to donate anymore. Others will think oh this is peanuts. This is a very small amount that is not able to solve big problems. And so it's not clear to us whether financial metrics are key. For us, the key is to create the trust where people feel that whatever you give to our organization gets deployed to the real needs, to the acute needs that the volunteer team see on the ground. That's kind of our view of this. Yeah. That's really helpful. Don, I'd love if, if you want to speak to this question about uh, trustworthiness. Yeah. And but it could, could also both you, all three of you, if you if you uh, have any thoughts also on, on this question of uh, speaking to people about the, the overall level of need right now, um, because I think this is something that has been a lot of fear about is that, you know, there's a sense that Ukraine's done much better, perhaps in this war than, than expected by many, and that there's a lot of money that's gone in, and maybe a little bit of fatigue in terms of people giving, thinking I've already given, things are already going well, maybe it's not so much needed anymore, like it was in those first days. Uh, we know that in any type of conflict, as time goes on, attention wanes. Um, so if you could all speak to that as well, in terms of, I mean, how urgent is this you know, is help now um, and what type of help in particular? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I was actually going to make a post about this because, you know, I mean, this comes out of uh, the events of the last 30 years. Everything that I've been working on and everybody else that I know who's a volunteer works on trust. 
you know that this guy is going to deliver. So when I do this, there's no messing around because we make it very explicit that uh, you know we're going to hand deliver to units and make sure that it gets there. The problem is the rest of the world doesn't work on this system. So they believe in big brands and everything else which haven't delivered. So what do we see? The guys at the tip of the spear here were peanuts in terms of the overall assistance. Hundreds of millions have been given to Ukraine. How much of it actually gotten to any hands in Ukraine? So when Natalia was talking about Chernigov, uh, my buddy Lex Brukovsky, who was a, a Canadian Ukrainian, uh, was the guy who drove into Chernigov and then he blew the bridge and he was trapped there for four days, right? He could not get people to go. That was the number one problem they had is that guys would go on one mission to some place and then they would never go again because they didn't want to risk, right? So this is the problem. You have to deal with people that you know and people that you trust and people that you know that are going to be delivered in, in a very intense situation. So at the tip of the spear, there's very few bodies that are actually there actually delivering this stuff, right? And we see it's almost all organized by Ukrainians themselves. The same at the border, the same as all of this. It's been Ukrainian NGOs and Polish NGOs and other local NGOs who've been doing this work not those big brands that everybody has been giving all the money to. The level of fraud is staggering. And I think that people should really understand the level of malfeasance in terms of the assistance that has come in, right? No, I just want, I want to clarify, of, can I just get you to clarify on that though? Do you mean at the international level, not the Ukraine level? Yes, because I mean, this is one big debate going on right now of, uh, you know, well, Ukrainian okay, corruption has, has been a big issue, right? right? And then Ukrainians have been pushing yeah. back and saying, yeah, of course, there's been some corruption, but there's also been a Russian trope that has been, you know, exaggerated. So I just want you to be specific about what you what you specifically mean both. here, or both or whatever it is, uh, I want to just everyone to understand. I'm an anti-corruption guy who upset up Naboo. So from my perspective, right, everything's a nail. Uh, so I mean, the level of corruption is there. Has it gone down? Yes especially in the first two weeks, everybody knocked it off and said, okay, we have to save the country and everybody worked in one direction. Since then, there's been a lot of, how can I use this situation for my own advantage as well? Among the political elites, I'm not talking about ordinary people, all the volunteers and everybody else is just doing everything they can to save the country. The guys who are on the front line are there because they wanna save their country, right? And that's the bulk of people. Have some members of the elites use this situation for their own advantage? Absolutely. Are people taking out lots of money? The line of luxury cars that go in from Poland is staggering. Even the Poles themselves, does the army really need these many, uh, you know, uh, Bentleys? They kind of raise some questions about that. So there is that. But the amount of money raised by other people for Ukraine is the real issue. My current, uh, you know, beef today was there's a guy on Twitter who calls himself the Canadian Ukrainian volunteer that isn't in Ukraine. And yet he's raising all kinds of money that he alleges that he's giving to frontline forces. So, uh, you know, other people have looked at it and said, no, he doesn't tweet in Ukrainian time. So it's very clearly that it's a fraud. He's blocked me because I started to question the nonsense that he was spouting. How many of these other uh, people in the International Legion are collecting money? And it's not clear what they're using this for, right? There are huge problems in terms of people making money off this situation, saying they're going to give for Ukraine. Uh, a lot of it in Eastern Europe. There were a lot of frauds committed in terms of supplies that were given. There were a lot of fake body armor that was given. So this is exactly why I want you guys to give the answer to, you know, for people watching, I mean, that's the concern, right? And so how, how do they, you know, because I completely agree, it's about trust, right? But how, how do people who don't know uh, in person somebody, uh, you know, who they can trust? I mean, hopefully events like this and organizations like Northwestern are pointing people in some directions. But, um, you know, if, if somebody wants to go beyond the three of you, uh, you know, what are the criteria uh, that they can use to quickly figure out who is a fraud and who is not? Simply look at the delivery. So this is what you know all international organizations measured on delivery rate. So I can say that when you go to Bucha and you're looking who's delivering food assistance, that's a very small number, right? If you're looking at other people who are actually doing stuff, and that's why it requires a bit of uh, being on the ground and, and looking. And unfortunately, there's very few uh, international organizations who are actually on the ground delivering. So that was been my litmus test to say who is actually present and what is their current delivery rate for all of this? There are 
millions of organizations wanting to help Ukraine, having a bake sale and whatever, the percentage of that money that's actually getting forward to those most in need. And as Natalia was saying, you know, the assistance that comes in, the shampoo and stuff, yes, it's all needed, but it needs to be sorted, packaged and delivered. And these are exactly the lessons learned in the Donbass. This is not the first time. So this is the baby box scandal and all the other scandals that existed for the last eight years. This is what's needed is to somebody to say, what are you actually doing? And what I appreciate the most right now is that's the first question that all Ukrainians are asking. What have you done actually since the 24th of February? That's gonna be the litmus test for anybody who wants to show up later on and work in Ukraine, is that you're gonna get that direct question. What have you actually done? What did you actually deliver? And if you're not showing your face right now in, inside Ukraine and helping really then I don't think that people are gonna have a, a big chance to do things after it. There's a lot of Johnny come lately's now who are now showing up and, and having croissants or whatever else in, in the terrible war tour in uh, Lviv. But the reality <laughs> is, is that this needs to get uh, to Chernihiv. It needs to get to Sumy. It needs to get to all the places that really need help. Kharkiv, Kharkiv not, doesn't need teddy bears. That's what they were getting in one container, a load of teddy bears. What they need is actually earth moving equipment that's able to take away the rubble and get people that uh, get bodies out and everything else. The, the needs are so great, especially in the newly liberated areas. And yet, unfortunately, we do not see an effective international response. And this is where people should start to raise questions about where did my donations go? Where have my tax dollars gone? And why the hell haven't you been doing anything for the last two months? Yeah, we've got five minutes and I want anyone else who has questions, please to put them in the in the box of the Q&A box so we can get them to our panelists. And then I wanted to give you know each of you a, a minute to, to say anything final that you think in terms of the, the most important things that people who want to be helping should know that we have not already covered. Uh, Daniel and, and Natalia, do you want to share anything that we haven't touched on that people really need to know? I yield to Natalia to say uh, her final word. I'll be happy to translate. Okay. Uh, мне, мне немножко сформулируй э, вопрос. Просто какое-то заключительное слово. У нас осталось пять минут. Просто последнее, что вы бы хотели донести, какую информацию. Ну, во-первых, я хотела бы поблагодарить абсолютно всех, кто помогает, потому что все, все то, что приходит в гуманитарной помощи, оно доходит туда, куда нужно. Со Львова грузят нам. Со Львова грузят на Харьков, на Чернигов, на Николаев, Буча, Ирпень. То есть они отправляют очень много машин. И действительно, и памперсы нужны. Мы не отказываемся от памперсов. Но памперсы нужны сейчас больше в местах, где находятся переселенцы. В те села, в те места, куда я приезжаю, там детей практически нет. Их, слава Богу, эвакуировали. Поэтому все то, что приходит, оно поступает по назначению. Я хотела донести немножко другую мысль о том, что мы-то с середины видим самую острую проблематику. То есть получили памперсы, их распределили, раздали в центры, где находятся переселенцы, раздали адресно, развезли. Но когда я приезжаю в город который, или в село, которое только освободили, там немножко другие потребности. Вот. Поэтому э, все то, что приходит, и мы очень признательны за эту помощь, оно все попадает. Но мы видим еще самые такие, вот, знаете, темные места, которые очень сложно извне, то есть я, я даже сама иногда не знаю, что там происходит. Мы приехали в село, и понимаем, что куда, какая подушка, если нет дома. So, То есть мы не можем привести эту подушку. Uh, есть, вы, вы поняли, ли, о чем я говорю? То есть мы видим те уголки темные, которые, к сожалению, никто не понимает, что там после того, как вышли оттуда русские. И в me... этот момент мы везем этот генератор. Давайте uh, дадим yeah. Даниилу секунду просто перевести, чтобы все поняли, и потом вы, вы можете продолжить. Извините. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, so first, I'm very thankful to everyone who is providing aid. Be sure that a lot of this aid does get to the right people, that the, a lot of 
uh, cargo and aid that is being loaded and involved does get to Kharkov, Bucha, Irpin. We do need diapers. The diapers are appreciated. We're delivering them to people who need them and, uh, and so forth. But the diapers are mostly needed in the refugee centers, in the places that we're going to, the liberated areas of Kiev and Chernigov region. There are no kids left. All of them, fortunately, have been evacuated. So I, where in the places where we go, we see the need in the dark corners that others just cannot uh, understand uh, from the outside. We see the dark corners were and, and the special needs that are needed there. Um, uh, I yeah, would just, just yeah, yep, go ahead. Я вижу, Дональд пишет, что Каритас, мы получали помощь от Каритас, и мы пользуемся теми же памперсами, салфетками влажными. То есть мы получали, с нами делятся. Это правда, оно у нас есть. И мы уже не тратим на памперсы и на салфетки. Мы за эти деньги покупаем колбасу, хлеб, молоко свежее. То, что мы можем довести здесь и сейчас. Yeah. So uh, I just want to say that I do see uh, we are getting uh, help from Caritas, the, uh, the towels and uh, the hygienic products and so forth. So it is definitely helpful. And what it does to us is that we no longer need to spend our resources on sourcing those items and are able to redirect them to buying cottage cheese, sausages, other, other goods that are not able to be sourced from the international aid. Um, and one thing I, I just wanted to add there is that if people want to know where to help, help Ukrainian organizations. They've been carrying the load. That's who really needs the help, right? Yeah, and I, I just, sorry, I, I did want to add a couple of things that I think... Give you the last yeah. word. Yes, okay. I, I do think that the last mile delivery, there is a need for funds there. And whatever you drop to the last mile in the frontline yeah. cities, goes to work because it will be directed where it's needed. Even if the need is unclear at the time the funds arrive, when it's spent on something in the store, the store pulls in the supplies, the gas station, then have money to source fuel coming to those and so forth. So just dropping the money to the final line of the logistics helps the entire system. And um, it's not about the items, it's about funding also the final line of uh, that provides the support to the population. Yeah. We need more truck drivers. We'll work on that, Don. <laughs> it's a, thank you so much to all of you for taking time out of the important work you're doing. We would really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to those of you who have been watching. Uh, for people who uh, think others will want to you know, know more about this and weren't able to join, uh, as always, we will post all of this information. It'll be on the Buffett Institute's website. It'll be on the Russian, uh, Eurasian, uh, East European Studies uh, Program's website. Uh, and so please feel free to sh share that. Um, and uh, we will certainly put it out on social media as well. I have put in the box um, for the chat for everybody. Uh, you should be able to see it, the, the links to donate to all three of the organizations that were represented here. Uh, Don also added, um, you know, this in response to this question about what international organizations are doing good work, uh, World Central Kitchen and Caritas. Um, and so those are uh, some tips. And, and if you have questions for our panelists um, that you would like to, um, you know, down the road, find out more about, feel free to connect with me. You can get all my information, Jordan Gansmore's online at Northwestern's um, Political Science Department or, or Russian, Eurasian, East European Studies Program. And I will pass it on to our panelists to try to get answers for you because we really do want to uh, do our best to help connect you to the people who, who, who want to help, who, to the people who need the help on the front lines of Ukraine. So thank you, everybody. We wish you the best. Uh, stay safe and um, have a good evening.